Today we're going to talk about what any type of property is worth. We're going to do it in a fairly simplistic fashion. But what do you think a property is worth? All right, so what I put is uh, it's worth what a buyer in the marketplace is willing to pay. But you're right, the seller has to be willing to take it too. There are two types of CRE buyers, right? There's the person who's going to invest, and anybody who's going to invest in real estate is looking for a return. So most of what we do in value is figuring out the return. But return can be a lot of different things. We also have users, and there are times when a user will pay more for a property than an investor because they make money on their business as opposed to making as much money on the real estate. Does that sound reasonable? We focus on two different ways of considering value. When we're talking to buyers, and how many of you have the Analyst Pro? Quite a few of you, that's great. Uh, I'll use a little bit of that today. When we look at buyers and we're talking to buyers, what buyers are concerned about is not necessarily the price they're paying, but the return they're making, right? We've got to look at it over the time now on a cap rate. We've got to look at it over that 10 year holding period. How much do they make? And the reason people buy things at five or six or 7% cap rates is because by the time you pay down that debt in 10 years, and by the time your inflation or your growth rate grows the income on that, and by the time you sell it at a higher price later on and do an internal rate of return calculation, you might have 16, 18, 20% return. And that's why we buy it. But for sellers, we're trying to figure out what it's worth today to a buyer. We're not trying to sell them on what kind of return they're making over time. We're trying to figure out in this snapshot in time what a seller is going to be able to get out of a buyer. So two most common questions I get all the time. What should I use as a cap rate is probably the number one call I get. And where can I find comps is number two, right? Because it's not like residential real estate. Residential real estate, we can go to the multi-list. We can try and find properties to compare, and we can work on it that way. I always look at value in three ways. Market value is the most probable selling price to a typical market participant, assuming normal market sale conditions. In other words, if you're selling it to your kid, if you're selling it to your best friend, it's going to be different than the market value. There's also investment value, because the value to a particular individual might be higher or lower than the market based on their tax rates, based on uh, what they can do with the property. And then sometimes we look at the transaction price, what people actually pay. Now we're gonna spend a little bit of time today talking about price fluctuation because a lot of things are happening in the market, right? So we look at changing cap rates, which I will talk about in about half an hour. Price trends and analyzing property cash flows is what we're really gonna go into. Now I'll give you an example of a mistake I made. By the way, I've made every mistake there is at least twice. So I went to look at this commercial property, this is about 15, 20 years ago, and uh, I had my comps pulled ahead of time. It's worth 350,000. So I know it's worth 350,000 all day long. There's no way it's worth more than that. Went in there, took a look at this property. This is a major road here. So we've got a property worth about 350,000. He said he wants 550. I said, where did you come up with 550,000? Well, I still owe 300,000 on the property. I wanna be able to buy a property without having a mortgage, and I need a new truck, and I want a boat. So that is not how you price property. So we parted ways, I called him back two or three days later, and he said, oh, I sold it for full price. What do you mean you sold it for full price? Well, apparently, whoops, apparently, the land right behind it is an industrial piece with no access to the highway. And that sort of thing happens from time to time, doesn't it? So if we don't investigate thoroughly, sometimes we miss an opportunity to try and put a deal together that uh, wouldn't necessarily fit the norm. So we're always looking at how to price stuff. Now what we're gonna do today is, I'm gonna go through some of the basics, concepts of value pretty quickly. Those of you who are relatively new might think I'm going a little fast. Those of you who are CCIMs, and there's quite a few in the room, are gonna think I'm going ridiculously slow. We're gonna talk about some different valuation methods and one of the most important parts is where can you find data and how do you put it together. We're gonna to predict the future a little bit with indicators and then we're gonna do a little bit of a case competition here with the stuff that's on the table. So the other question I get constantly, by the way, I get these calls every week and I apologize, some of you I don't get back to because I'm, I'm mentoring people, I'm working, I'm doing a lot of things and I get these, do you have a minute calls? Do you have a minute? I'm in Texas or Arkansas, and I need to help your help pricing a property real quick. And usually it's residential, by the way, which is even funnier. 
But uh, I need you to help me price something real quick. See, I've got a 747 that was turned into a house. Did I price it by square foot? Uh, there's this guy who built this house into a car type thing. It's three stories, it's 4,000 square feet. And then there's another one around the corner that looks pretty much the same. Uh, I've got one that looks like a pair of dice. Um, somebody built one out of a bottle. Can we, uh, can we figure out exactly what that's worth? Is that a per square foot prices? So many different interesting properties out there that people actually somehow build. I love this one. Interesting properties all over the place. By the way, this does have public water and sewer. It is two stories. Um, don't know if I'd live in it or not. Neighbors must have fun with that one. What we are going to do today is talk about how to price commercial property. I'm going to go through how to price hot commercial corner that's vacant. I'm going to try and talk about office buildings and shopping centers that are half empty and how to figure out what the value of those are. Um, we'll talk a little bit about land development opportunities and how to calculate what's called a hurdle rate to figure that out. What about a hotel with real estate and business? a self-storage facility, and why would a triple net detached pad site trade at a different price than the exact same size property that might be a retail strip center? What's the importance of that? So I want to start a little bit with basics. Now everybody knows what an appraisal is. There are three ways we do an appraisal. Sales comparison approach, income approach, and cost approach. An appraiser is going to do all three of these on every commercial property, and they're going to reconcile them. And when they reconcile them, they're going to give different weights each of these three Now we don't have to do all of that but we do want to have an idea what is most appropriate for whatever we're pricing and when we talk about income approach there's two income approaches we typically use one's called direct capitalization that's pricing it by the cap rate second way is called discounted cash flow and that's when we have something called a non-stabilized property so these are the ways we value property and each property might fit into a different category we want to look at sales comparison approach, cost approach, and income approach have different uses. So if I've got a piece of land that I'm going to build something on, there's actually two ways I might price it. One is by sales comparison, maybe on a per square foot basis. The second is how much income I can generate, but that becomes what kind of development I'm going to do and how do I back into the residual land value. If I've got a user-occupied property, I can price it based on other users using similar properties at sales comparison. On direct capitalization, any stabilized asset that's producing an income, multifamily, office, retail, triple net, anything that's stabilized. When I say stabilized, it's rented, it's cash flowing, you don't have to fill it up. But there are times when you find a shopping center that's half empty, and we're gonna go into this. And that shopping center, the owner does not want to price at it being half empty. And the buyer doesn't want to pay the price as if it's fully rented. So we do something called a discounted cash flow. And we'll do a very simplistic version of that today. And cost approach, we're going to look at warehouses. Because frankly, if you're trying to buy a three-year-old warehouse and there's land down the street to build one, you're not going to pay more than you can build it for. And development projects, we do look at that as a cost approach as well. And we also look at a direct capital or a uh, discounted cash flow in that as well. Now, any of these three approaches follow three principles, and I'll explain why this is critical. Highest and best use, supply and demand, and the principle of substitution. Highest and best use, supply and demand, and the principle of substitution. Here's a commercial corner. Now, over here, we've got an eight-lane road, four in each direction, with a median in the center. And I've got to figure out what this corner is worth. It's pretty hard to figure out because there's a lot of stuff that can go there, and the value of this property is directly uh, set to whatever we can actually put in that lot. So for example, these are all roughly the same size lot. Now they're different parts of the country, but they're all roughly the same size lot. Here I've got a dollar store that is rented at 88.5 a year triple net. So I can figure out what the cap rate is, which we'll talk about in a little bit, for that area, for that type of property, I can divide 88.5 by whatever that cap rate is, six, seven, eight percent, whatever that cap rate is, in this case 5.6, and I've got a value, a million and a half. Same size lot, we put a BP on it. BP is paying 132,000 for the same size lot. It's a lot different, right? So this property is worth a whole lot more if I can rent it to BP, and there's a McDonald's paying 133. So the value of this, if I can get one of those on there, is worth a lot more. Now here's the kicker, if we put a CVS on it, 
Here's a CVS paying $385,000. 88 for a dollar store or 300,000 more per year for CVS. And one other thing, which one is gonna have a higher cap rate? CVS or the dollar store? Dollar store. This is a better asset because they're not gonna go anywhere. They're gonna do a 30 year lease and they're not gonna go anywhere. And because of that, we've got a, a better tenant. We're gonna be able to sell it, trade it at a lower cap rate. So not only do we have a higher income, we've got a lower cap rate, we have a significantly more valuable property if we can get a CVS there. Problem is, on some of these corner sites, you might not be able to fit a CVS, because CVS is pretty big. So we have to scale down to something that pays almost as much, and we keep scaling down. Now here's another one, this is actually in my marketplace. By the way, for those of you who don't know, I do a lot of things, but I own several Century 21s, we cover Eastern Pennsylvania and New Jersey. I'm also the broker of record for Century 21s in Delaware, and uh, I think all of you know I'm a professor at Leo University, and I'm also the program director for it. So we lay out the whole curriculum for a real estate degree. In this area, this happens to be the Poconos, about eh, two hours north of Philadelphia. Net income, 462.5 for a CVS, compared to 88,000 for a dollar store. So normally, we look at what the highest use is if we can get them there. CVS is gonna pay more, Rite Aid, Walmart, or uh, Walgreens, is gonna pay more per square foot than somebody like Sheets or Wawa or Rudders or Royal Farms. But Sheets and Wawa and Rudders make more per square foot than McDonald's, Burger King, or Wendy's. So that business model means that they're going to actually be a better tenant, lower cap rate, higher income, higher net income, on one of these than we will with a uh, McDonald's or a Burger King. We might also get a bank in there. McDonald's and Burger King are gonna have a higher income than dollar store. So we've gotta figure out what we can put there, and we've also gotta figure out what kind of return we're gonna get. Now, if I'm looking at a site like that one we just looked at, I've gotta figure out a few things, and the principle of highest and best use says, has to be legally permissible. So when we're evaluating this property, we've got to look at zoning and we've got to look at deed restrictions. I've run into many cases over the years where we see a corner site that's deed restricted against using it for a bank because a church owned it at one point in time and they don't want a bank there. Or because a bank had owned it and doesn't want another bank on that corner. Is it legally permissible? Can we put it there? Is it physically possible? CVS might not fit on that corner. They're not gonna make a smaller CVS. Financially feasible. It doesn't matter how much money they can make there, they're not spending $14 million on that site. And there are a lot of owners who think they can. And we look for the most profitable use of that site. CVS will pay more than Wawa. Wawa's gonna pay more than the bank or McDonald's. Bank or McDonald's is gonna pay more than the dollar store. Does that all make sense? So that's the first principle. Second one is supply and demand. We all know this. There are not enough homes in the market in the residential area. Because of that, prices are rising. If we look at commercial right now, in some parts of the country, warehousing is at a premium. In some areas, warehousing has doubled in price in the last 18 months. Anybody experience that? It's unbelievable. Office space is going the other direction. Office space, unfortunately, people are starting to work out of their houses more and more. There's not as much of a need in many areas for office space. Depends if you're in a central business district or a suburban market. So supply and demand really controls pricing as well. We've got to watch that as well, what's going to happen next. And then the last one is principal substitution. This is where we come into the cost approach for warehousing. The value of a property tends to be set by the cost of acquiring an equally desirable substitute property. If I can buy a different warehouse down the street, I'm going to buy that different warehouse. Now all of these are important for any type of evaluation that we do. And when we're doing a sales comparison approach, which is the first one I'm going to do, I'll do sales comparison, then direct cap, then discounted cash flow. The first thing many of you do is to start finding comps. I actually suggest the first thing is to try and figure out what you're going to compare with, the elements of comparison, the value adjustment. If you're looking at a house and you're trying to compare it, you want colonials. You want it in the same school district, the same neighborhood. You want four bedrooms. You want two and a half baths. In commercial, we're looking at the same class, the same category, the same use. We want to figure out what we're looking at first, and then we pick our sales comparables. And we're gonna have to pull them from a lot of different places. 
Once we pull those comparables, we're gonna adjust them just like an appraiser would. We're gonna adjust those sales price to approximate the subject. Are we better or worse? And then we're gonna reconcile those sales prices to try and figure out what our property's worth. That's how we figure it out. When I'm looking at sites, when I'm looking at buildings, we have to find something similar. We wanna look if it's medical, office condo, medical office, um, office with lab space. Anybody know the big difference between office and medical office? That's right, clean spaces and somebody said water. But you've gotta have water almost everywhere, right? You've gotta have it in labs, you've gotta have it in um, the main hallways, you've gotta have it in each of the exam rooms. Medical requires a lot of water. It also requires clean rooms, it requires certain types of uh, HVAC systems. You can't just take a regular general office building without completely converting it. So when we're trying to price something, you should not be using general office buildings to compare with medical space. We've got to figure out what we have. We also want to look at if we've got class A, B, C, or F. And sometimes you don't have enough comps, so you're going to have to adjust. And we want to double check some considerations, like how old is the building? Uh, everybody knows that things have changed over time, right? If you're looking at multifamily that was built in the 80s, the ceiling heights are a certain height. If you look at multifamily 10 years ago, they got two feet higher and it feels different walking through and younger people pay more for those spaces. Is it in an opportunity zone? If it's in an opportunity zone, no matter where you are in the country, a TIF or a NIS or a whatever system you happen to have in your state, you're getting breaks. You might be getting tax breaks, you might be getting money back on personnel taxes. There's all sorts of things that go into an opportunity zone. And because of that, they get priced differently because you're getting benefits back. Are you in an opportunity zone? Is it a multi-tenant building versus a single tenant? Do we have LEED or Energy Star certification? Are we in a central business district versus suburban? These are all things we've got to factor in when we're figuring out our comps. Now for warehouse, let me give you an example. So a student of mine from six or seven years ago went to work in real estate and he did not work in sales. He instead worked in analysis. So other people in his firm would send stuff to him to try and analyze and figure out what it was worth, to try and figure out how it would cash flow, whether or not it was a good deal for institutional investors. So he spent a lot of time sending stuff directly back and forth to some of these institutional investors. Now, this is a young guy, he's in his 20s. He finds what he thinks is a good deal. It's an old factory. He talks to several institutional investors that he's been dealing with. Again, he's not actually in sales, he does have a license. And he gets one of them to agree to fork up $75 million to buy this property, and he becomes a general partner. They built this for $75 million. They're going to cut it up into a couple of spaces and rent it, which will be easy. And then they'll flip it for probably $125, $130 million. This is a young kid in his 20s. I'm saying this because there's always opportunity out there. The big thing is trying to figure out how to make those connections. So anyway, this building, just off I-95 between Philadelphia and New York, and we want to look at these types of spaces and determine whether they're refrigerated or general, because there's a big difference in price, what the clear span ceiling height is up to the bottom of those beams, the distance between columns is really important, number of dock doors, uh, if it's flush docks or intermediate platforms, how much power is coming in, and again, are we in a tax or opportunity zone, because that's going to skew the numbers. Do we have solar power, which a lot of them have now, and do we have rail, rail service? Because we're gonna compare properties with rail service to other properties with rail service. Now I'm pointing this particular building out for a reason. Next door is this building. Same size, right next door to each other. You can't use this as a comp, even though they're right next to each other. Very, very different animals. You've got a much lower ceiling height, the columns are much closer together. It's a masonry building. Very different. So when I'm trying to price something like this, even if I have to go further out, I'm trying to find the most similar property I can, even if it's not directly in the same area. So where do I find comparables? Depending on what you're selling, you might find them in the multiple listing system. Particularly certain areas around the country, they do have a lot of decent data in the multi-list. Some areas you find them in the tax records. We're also gonna look in CoStar and Crexy and uh, Catalyst are three of the main sources. I'm also gonna show you how to use Reonomy to pull comps, and you can pull some data from NAR RPR. So there are, from tax records, a problem in some states. 
These are non-disclosure states, and they've got limited information. Texas, Indiana, Maine, Kansas. It's harder to find data. Some areas have really good data, some areas don't. So we've got to back up to something else. Now this is the bright multiple listing system. I know everybody's got their own system. This one goes from Washington, D.C. to north of Philadelphia. It covers uh, five or six states. It's actually a fairly decent system. So for those of you in that particular system, you can go and try and figure out what type of property, uh, automotive, it's truck or trailer parking, car spaces, everything you need is actually here to search as long as somebody put it in. So there are some multi-lists that are pretty good. If we don't have a good multi-list, hopefully you have a CIE in your area. That's a commercial information exchange. It's like a multi-list, but it's for commercial. Most of them are done by Catalyst, although there are a few that are not. They are not available everywhere in the country. But it's one of the more cost-effective methods of putting something together. And I suggest, if you don't have one in your area, trying to get your board to do it. Does anybody know why many large commercial brokerages don't let their listings go into multiple listing system? Anybody want to take a couple of shots? Yeah. That's true. That's one of the reasons. Everybody in the, system, in the company has to belong to the MLS. Other reasons? That's true, they, don't, they would get a call from people who don't know commercial real estate. You know, interestingly enough, I was, uh, this is probably seven or eight years ago, I was the keynote at uh, the Real Estate Today conference in New York. And I stood up and made the comment that I thought everything, whether it's in a CIE or an MLS, that everything should be listed that everybody can see it. And like war erupted in the room. It was incredible. But the reality is if you cast the widest net, you have the highest probability of getting a decent price for it rather than hiding it and selling it to certain people. Uh, very often, too often, you'll go to one of these large commercial firms, you'll show their property, and they'll come back and say, get your commission from the buyer, I'm not paying you anything. So one of the reasons is that they don't want to be restricted by MLS rules because the MLS has a code of ethics, right? And those brokers that are part of that are not part of the code. It's true. It's true, I'm being recorded, but it's absolutely true. I've heard this too many times. They don't want to have to be pushed around by other people. They don't want non-qualified people showing their properties. They also want to double-end it, which I do not think is in the best interest of their clients. There are a lot of them that do not publish their stuff. There's a lot of reasons they use, but there are a lot of them that don't publish the stuff. Now, in some areas, they'll do CIEs, like Catalyst, and the reason they do it is because they don't have to follow the MLS rules. Now, some of these are sponsored by the MLS, but they don't follow the same rules as an MLS. So you'll get to some areas where you'll see the CBREs and the JLLs and the Cushmans in these types of systems. So the idea is to try and get everybody working together. Now, this works just like a multiple listing system, but it's got the data set up specifically for commercial. Now, these are the areas the Catalyst has now, Arizona, Arkansas, Atlanta, Charlotte, some of them are just cities, Los Angeles, uh, all of Nevada, the North Carolina Triangle, Ohio, Northern California, San Antonio and Austin, where we'll be in three weeks, Southeast Florida has one, St. Louis has one, uh, Tulsa, Utah, Wisconsin. Now I'm in the Philadelphia marketplace. Uh, we cover up to the New York border. We don't have this. If you have access to this, please go out and join it as soon as humanly possible. And one of the things that Randy's been working on is making sure that Catalyst's broad uh, system has all of your listings on it, so that at least anywhere in the country you can get to that. But being able to find data is critical, and I'm hoping over time that this becomes more of a national trend, having these. It's like a multi-list, but for commercial properties, and some commercial brokers get into it. So if you don't have that, then we back up to CoStar. CoStar is about, I don't know, five, 600 bucks a month. So I don't have to go into this in too much detail, but obviously you can pull down what type of property you're searching for, office, industrial, retail, healthcare, and you can scale it that way. But over on the right-hand side, it allows you to put in all sorts of stuff to try and figure out what you're looking at. I might want to put in only 50,000, 100,000 square foot buildings, or 50,000 to 200,000 square foot buildings. I may only want, in this case, office, and I may only want sales after uh, two years ago, in the last 24 months. I can put in triple net properties, I can put in whatever I want, class A, B, and C. And if you put in too many restrictions and nothing comes up, start widening your search, because you've got to find something. Print these, because we're going to take data from several different sources, and we're going to have to build it into a table of some sort in order to do a CMA. We can't just print it out of the multi-list. So sale date in the last two years, sale price, cap rate, property type, secondary property type. Is it an investment or an owner-user? 
and pull everything you can to try and put something together. Again, we can do single tenant or multi-tenant class uh, amenities. We can put in year built, lots of data that we can use. And it does give some pretty decent data in some markets, not all of them. Now an alternative, not that it's necessarily spectacular, but it does work. Uh, some of you use Reonomy for prospecting. So Reonomy has a button up at the top. If you pull up a property, this happens to be a building that I own. On 0.61 acres, it's a major commercial corner. So up at the top, it says find comps. Now this one happens to be one of our real estate offices. So if I click on find comps, it pulls up other properties that Reonomy thinks is similar. And it does have a lot of inform information on them. It doesn't necessarily have income, but it at least gives you some properties that you can then follow up on and start trying to build a table. Interestingly enough, it pulled up the local Remax office as a comp. But it gives us some starting point if we have access to this to try and find information to put together. And then up at the top, it does allow us to slant it by property type. There's a lot of filters, building area. We can put in all sorts of filters, just like CoStar, it just doesn't have as much financial data. Again, medical office, we can slant it to financial buildings. We can at least look at everything that's sold and try and narrow down what we're looking at as a comparison. And this happens to be the office that uh, they came up with, which was interesting because it's a competitor. The other one is NAR RPR. You can do a search on NAR RPR of comps. It does not give you a lot of data, but it does allow you to search for sale and it allows you to break down office, retail, and so on. And we'll pull up some comparables. Again, it's a starting point more than anything else. If nothing else, you can use some of them as sales comparison. You might not know the cap rate. You might not know the uh, income and expenses, but at least you've got something to start with when you're going out to talk to someone. And again, you can break it down by a lot of different categories. And it does do some pretty nice reports from that particular system. So what we're gonna do next is we're gonna take those comps because we have to figure out how we're coming up with a price if we're doing a sales comparison approach. We gotta find out what's most important and build a table of what's most important. Now here I'm actually slanting it toward cap rate. But if I'm doing a lot, I'm gonna figure out what the price per square foot is in the area and how similar they might be. So I'm trying to put together a table that allow me to easily re, uh, rationalize what the value is. And I'm going to then put it together in something that someone can read. Now, when we're looking at elements of comparison, I'm not suggesting this is the end all way of doing any sort of CMA, but a price per acre for land or price per square foot for land, price per unit for multifamily. Now, I don't like doing that because frankly, in some multifamily, the landlord's paying a heavy cost and in some, the tenant is, and in some, the costs are lower. I really like doing it by income. But you can do a sales comparison approach to justify or help justify your cap rate approach as well. Price per square foot for office or warehouse or something like that and price per key for hotels. And we might adjust it by the mix of unit or type of unit, quality of construction, the age of the building and improvements and the strength of the location. Mix of units, which is better for a multifamily buyer? All one bedroom units or all two bedroom units? It all depends. One bedrooms do tend to be more transitory though. Two bedrooms tend to keep people in there longer. It all depends on what somebody's looking for. And then we're gonna take this information and we're gonna put it into some sort of CMA that we can actually give a client, hopefully. So we might use, in this case, I think that is real next, but the Analyst Pro now has a pretty nice uh, layout to put sales comps right into your presentation. So if you can find some ahead of time, you can build a presentation with sales comps built in. So when you're going through it with your client, and don't email it to your client, go talk to your client about it. You'll be able to at least pull up information to go through with them. Now, where should we use sales comps? We're using them to help justify the price in multifamily, office, retail, or warehouse, but not as the primary valuation method. And the user, if the user is comparing different locations for their business, it's important to do it that way. And we should use sales comps for land and other user-occupied sites. So here's an example. Let's say we've got a corner lot on uh, 101 Philadelphia Pike. It's about an acre. It's a uh, corner, it's got a traffic count of 25,000 cars a uh, day. And we're trying to figure out what it's worth. So we pull comparables of similar properties. We find one on the next corner. It's about the same size, 38,000 square feet and it's sold for 800,000. So we divide, and over on the right, we get 21 bucks a square foot for the price per square foot. We then pull another one, which is only two doors away, but it's mid block. And that went for 18 bucks a square foot. Then we find one at 227 Philadelphia Pike, a block and a half away, that's half an acre. 
went for 1583 a square foot. Now we have two other ones, Baltimore Boulevard, a larger corner lot that went for 1864, and Broadway, which is a similar size, also a corner lot, not as high a traffic count, that went for 17 bucks. Now I've got some pretty good data here, so I can come up theoretically with a price. Now I wanna try and look at the visibility, the traffic count, I wanna look at the zoning to make sure all the zoning is the same or very similar, demographics of the surroundings, because you might have a high traffic count, but you might have one location where you're more likely to put a dollar store and one location where you're more likely to put a Tiffany's. So we wanna look at that and what the coverage ratio is, because in some areas, we can only build on a certain percentage of that land, right? So if I look at this, what most people end up doing is actually just taking an average price per square foot, which is 18 bucks, and we've got a value of 725,000. Now the problem with that, you've got this one up here but at 21 bucks, that is the next corner. So 18 might be pretty low. So I'm gonna try and adjust it to figure out what it's really worth. Now I might discount everything and say, listen, that corner is fantastic. It's got about the same traffic count. It's about the same size. If that went for 21 bucks a square foot, I'm sticking to that, that's what it's worth. Or I might decide that I'll use the other corner locations and try and give more weight to those than I will to a mid unit. And yes, we are making a guess, but we're making an educated guess based on data. And hopefully, we'll be able to use a second form of valuation to justify our assessment. That's what we're really looking for. So what I might do is I might take all that data and I might change it over to whether it's equal, superior, or inferior. We've all seen this in, in broker price opinions, right? 201 Philadelphia Pike is equal in square footage, more or less, equal in location and equal in traffic count. That's our strongest comp. The mid-block one, same area, same size, but it's not as good a location. Baltimore Pike is a better size lot, equal in location and traffic count, than the others are mid-block, which is not great, and a little smaller. So I might then take this data and I might weight it. And I might decide, and by the way, there's no science to this, it's somewhat subjective. I might say that first comp at 201, I'm gonna give 50% weight to. And by the way, you can sell this to a client all day long. I might give 20% weight to the one that's mid-block, but in the same block. I might give 15% weight to the next corner and zero to, the, to a block down the street in the middle that's small, and then another 15% to Broadway. And that comes up with a value of uh, just under 20 bucks. Now again, I might decide I really just wanna use the one a block away but I'm trying to weigh it to try and figure out where exactly I'm gonna come in with in terms of price. And if I do use something under 20 bucks, I still have a 779 value. But I might again slant it toward the, uh, the one that's the next block over. Really trying to figure out what something's worth. Now this is a lot more subjective. When we get to direct cap, it makes it a little bit easier if we can figure out what the cap rate is that we're trying to do. So cap rates allow us with a single calculation, a simple calculation and a single one, to compare properties of varying sizes and come up with a value. The biggest question I get is, where do I find these cap rates? I'm gonna show you four or five different places that might work. How do I estimate market value with cap rates and will rising interest rates affect those cap rates and property value? And can we forecast what's coming? So we're gonna use cap rate for almost everything because it's a real simple calculation and it allows us to value almost anything. Senior living, golf courses, marinas, do all of it by cap rate. Mobile home parks, self-storage. Now we have got some pretty complex Excel spreadsheets for some of this stuff, but it still comes down to a value with cap rate. And since all of you have been in commercial while, you all know it's the IRV formula, income equals rate times value. It comes down to cap rate is your net income divided by your sales price. That's how we calculate cap rate. And the value, once we get five or six points saying what the cap rate is in an area, or we pull it from a, a chart, then we can calculate the value of a property as long as we know the net income, as long as we know the cap rate for the area. So we're gonna be able to value that building based on cap rate. So if I've got a gross income of 100,000, vacancy rate of 5%, and expenses of 35,000, I've got 60,000 as an NOI, 7% cap rate, divide 60 by 7%, I've got a value of the property. Pretty easy, pretty simple calculation if we can get to the cap rate. So where do we find them? And by the way, something that uh, 
you can do an Analyst Pro, which I guess many people don't realize. When you're doing an initial report, when you're trying to do a CMA for someone, hopefully you've got some income and expenses before you get there, you might not. But if you do, you can start putting something together. And there's two parts here that you'll use. Instead of putting in a price, you don't want to put in a price that you're giving them before you ever meet with them. So if you pull down this menu on the first section, pull down purchase price, there's a little tab there that says acquisition cap rate. If you click on acquisition cap rate, you can actually plug in what you think the cap rate is in the area, and then when you put in income and expenses, it's going to give you a value that you'll be able to put into your report. Now, I'm also going to adjust it slightly because there's a way to actually have it come up with a few different ones. So I can put in a range, a price sensitivity range. I'm going to come back to that in a couple of minutes. So where do I find cap rates? We're going to extrapolate them from the MLS if that's what we have. We're going to try and find them on CoStar if CoStar has numbers. In many markets, they don't. I have uh, teams working right now and trying to estimate values of um, distribution warehouses in our tri-state area. And the challenge I'm running into is none of the brokers want to tell anyone what the rates were that they leased these buildings at because they were leased two years ago and they were different numbers. And nobody wants them online, so they've been removed from CoStar, which makes it hard sometimes to find data. But we want to look at recent sales in the market from the MLS, from CoStar, from Craxi, from Catalyst. We're also going to use local commercial appraisers. They are one of the best sources for information because they're compiling it on a regular basis and they're doing these. The MAI appraisers are doing these valuations. They know what the cap rates are. Really take time to get to know the appraisers. If you're nice to them, they will provide you information which makes your life a whole lot easier trying to figure this stuff out. And by the way, appraisers usually end up with the right numbers. What we see in the multiple listing system, what we see even in CoStar, often is a pro forma. It's what our best case might be if we were 100% rented 100% of the time and we didn't actually cut the lawn, right? And didn't have property management. So local commercial appraisers. And then we're also gonna look at investor surveys and research publications. There's some of them that are free and I'll show some of them to you. PWC, realty rates, um, realty rates charges you now. Integra Realty Resources, IRR.com is fantastic. And we've got access to REACH reports on 21 Online. You can pull a REACH report on 21 Online. Now, if I'm trying to find comps, I'm going to a multi-list. This, again, is uh, the bright multi-list, the DC Philadelphia system. Here's one on Coatesville. Again, real easy, four units, all three bedroom. Cap rate is NOI divided by sales price. We've got income somewhere on this page, but it's written up there, 38,121, divided by a sales price of 653. So if they included all the expenses, then we've got a cap rate of 5.8, at sold for. Now remember, real NOI versus your uh, pro forma. Try and get to the real NOI. You have to be very careful what you're using. It should include a vacancy pet factor and probably a management fee. Second one, eight units, six two bedrooms and two three bedrooms. Cap rate is, uh, or NOI is 149, sales price is 2.6 million, so 5.75. And then pulled a third one from Atlantic City. This one's four apartments and two commercial units. And that comes out to 9.25 cap rate. Now, why might that one be a much higher cap rate than the others? The commercial, right. So commercial's riskier. Cap rate is based on risk, right? That's one of the big caveats that we have to look at. It's really easy to fill an apartment these days. Two bedroom, three bedroom apartment will rent in no time. One bedroom apartment will rent in no time. But commercial spaces in Atlantic City might be a little tar more challenging to rent, even if they uh, have a good income. Here's one from Allentown, uh, Central 21 Ramos had it. This one particularly has a net income of 101,880, sales price of 1.155 million, 8.8% cap rate. Actually, pretty high cap rate for that type of building, but nice building, very easy to find this type of data. So we can put these together and try and come up with what the cap rate is in the area. Now, if we don't have this access, again, we're gonna back up to Catalyst. That's gonna be our best source, probably, if you happen to have it in your area. Uh, and again, it only hits certain areas, unfortunately. If we don't have that, then we're gonna go to CoStar. Now these happen to be, I don't remember if I pulled multifamily, I did. Multifamily, four units plus, sold in the last two years. Obviously we went the last six months and we can get them. We've got up here the cap rate that was recorded, 4.25 in September, 2022, for, these are in Orlando. 
for an $87.3 million property, 4.56 cap rate, 4.56, 5.87. Fairly tight range. And I'm able to pull this directly from CoStar to try and come up with what I think the cap rate's gonna be for similar properties like this. And again, we're gonna build a table. So this table is gonna allow us to justify what cap rate we're gonna give them. So we've got a building on Grimold Place, one on Nocturne Alley, one on Diagon Alley, and one on Spinner's End. Hopefully you know where all those are from. So we've got cap rates of six, six and a quarter, 5.75, and 6.1. Now again, we can just average those, come up with what we think the cap rate is in the area, and figure that at the high end, a 5.75 cap rate, we're worth about 2.2 million. At the low end of six and a quarter cap rate, because they're inversely related, we're at a $2 million price tag. So about $200,000 swing. We can try and figure out what we're closest to. And again, we can even weight them. We can decide that two of these are much better comps than the other two. We can give them a heavier weight and come down to a cap rate of 6.1, somewhere in the middle, and figure that that building's worth about 2.05 or 2.06 million. But we're looking to try and figure out what it's worth based on similar properties. Now again, remember cap rates in some locations are higher or lower depending on risk factor and expected growth. And the example I use all the time is if we're renting a CVS, and we've got a triple net lease, that's gonna be a low cap rate because it's very low risk, it's like an annuity. But if I've got a 1970s shopping center, that shopping center, by the way, has been torn down since I started using this example, it's now a hospital. It's higher risk, therefore you're gonna be doing a higher cap rate and a lower price. So you've gotta watch that. And all this stuff on, on uh, CoStar, even if I'm looking in this case for retail, we will be able to find buildings and try and figure out what they traded at. Now the problem with retail is you're gonna have some that are triple net and some that are shopping centers. So you got a shopping center here that traded a seven cap. You've got a single user, a Harley Davidson store that traded a six. And again, you've got a pharmacy up here that traded at 4.95. So if I'm looking in an area, I've gotta find the most similar comps I possibly can to try and figure out the cap rate. This is a pretty wide spread. 4.9 to seven is a pretty wide spread. But this is a higher cap rate because you've got a, a mixed property. CVS is gonna be paying the most. They're also gonna be the most solid tenant as a single tenant property, easy to manage. You don't have to have the parking lot plowed because they're taking care of it. You don't have to be collecting the garbage. You don't have tenants fighting with each other. And you have a very little chance, a very low uh, possibility of CVS moving out. Because of that, you're gonna be selling it at a lower cap rate. And if you pull some of these, it'll even give you for the area on CoStar what the average cap rate is, what the average sales per square foot is, and so on to give you some data. And again, we're gonna weigh those comps. We're gonna try and figure out what we think is most similar to the property that you're trying to value. And that's the direct comp area. One other one is Crexy. Now Crexy is kind of interesting because you can pull comparables from it. Crexy is uh, free for the most part. You know, you can do an upgraded uh, account, and I highly recommend it, because you can figure out who's looking at your properties. But in this case, I was looking at retail first, and it's giving me the average square foot, it's giving me the average sales price per uh, square foot, and down here, it's giving me the median sold cap rate, the median asking cap rate, for this type of property in that area. Not much of a spread, 6.9, 6.5, telling me what it is. So I tried pulling up self-storage. And self-storage in this particular area, and I took a broad area, but we've got a median sold price of 850,000, which sounds a little low to me, by the way. And we've got a cap rate, asking cap rate of only 6.5, but a sold cap rate average of nine. And it gives me the comps that I can then pull up and use, and it does have some offering memorandums and information on it. Here are the self-storage buildings that we pulled up sale date, sold price, square footage, price per square foot, number of units, sale NOI, uh, most recent list price, and cap rate for each of those properties. Now I've got a table right there. But it gives you a pretty nice area where you can actually pull up everything you need for a table to try and figure out what it's worth. Now this is IRR.com. This is free. This is the viewpoint uh, that came out about uh, six or seven weeks ago. If I wanna figure out what people are doing in cap rate and discount rate, because we're gonna use discount rate in a couple of minutes, I wanna figure out where, where we are in every particular marketplace. So Viewpoint tells me they have 240 markets that they use, 
and they build these tables. I know you can't read that, but across the left-hand side, actually I can't read it either. There's Northern New Jersey, there's Baltimore, there's uh, Minneapolis, St. Louis, Boise, Idaho, Denver, and it's all different types of properties. Now, where do they get this data from? This data actually comes from appraisers, MAI appraisers in every area. They turn all this information in, they collate it. So when sales happen, the appraisers do the appraisals, as long as it's mortgaged, right? And they turn in these numbers, and IRR actually uh, collates them, pulls them together, and comes up with what the average rate is for each type of property, each condition. And then they also do an estimation by pulling investor surveys of institutional investors where they expect cap rates to go, what they're uh, using as discount rates, and so on. So for example, uh, I know you can't read this across the top, but I've got central business district office, suburban office, industrial, flex, urban multifamily, suburban multifamily, regional mall, community center, neighborhood retail, class A. Same thing class B, discount rate. So if I am in northern New Jersey and I have a CBD office, 6% cap rate is the average right now. 6.5 for suburban. I can come over here and I can say, listen, if it's a uh, class B property, I jump from six to seven and a quarter. By the way, in a declining market, what declines first, class A, B, or C? C, whoever said that. So the, uh, the lower value, the lower properties actually decline first. The reason is we tend to fly, to have that flight to better quality. So people move into newer buildings, nicer buildings, and we end up having a harder time in class B and C. So 7% cap rate compared to six, seven point, I'm sorry, seven and a quarter compared to six, 7.75 compared to 6.5. The second thing they're looking at is discount rate. And we're gonna use that to figure out what investors are expecting when they start doing what we call discounted cash flow, a DCF to figure out what the value is. The other thing they give you, again, is the investor surveys. Now, these are institutional investors, where they expect the market to go and over the next uh, quarter, and what they're willing to use as discount rates and cap rates. So if I'm looking at um, the South region for Class A, cap rate, urban Class A right now is 4.65, well, like a month ago, discount rate 6.25, but the institutional investors expect it to drop a little bit. They're expecting it to come down, interestingly enough. In the West region, they're expecting the cap rate and discount rate to go up a little bit. So it gives you an indication of where everybody thinks things are going. Also gives you an idea where in the country we are in the market cycle, whether we're in recovery or expansion or hyper supply or recession, what areas are in each. So Los Angeles, it looks like, at least in the multifamily sector, might be in recovery. However, if you're in northern Jersey, you're going into recession in the multifamily market. Gives you a lot of data that you can use when you're trying to value something. And again, this is free, it's IRR.com, Integra Realty Resource. Now going back to Analyst Pro, again, we wanna create a package that shows them what their building's worth. So I'm gonna, instead of putting in a purchase price, in the first tab, I'm going to pull it down and hit acquisition cap rate, and I'm going to put in what I think the cap rate should be. And then we're going to bookend it. So I might put in this case uh, 6%. I put in a building that I happen to own. And then the next slide, income, I'm going to put in a quick income. I'm going to put in some quick expenses. Now, of course, in Analyst Pro, I can itemize the expenses into taxes, insurance, whatever I want to do, and try and come up with that. But here I put in a quick number. Next one, I put in a mortgage. Now, I didn't happen to put one in, but the mortgage is gonna help us to indicate whether or not we're gonna be making, we have positive leverage or negative leverage. But I'm gonna put that in for the moment. And then on the disposition and sale, I've gotta do what's called an exit cap rate, which I'm gonna come back around to. What's the cap rate gonna be when I sell? And we'll talk about why that might be a problem. And then the last one is what report do I want? I'm gonna do a 10-year report, and I'm gonna pull this down, and it gives me a lot of different options. Now, the one I'm going to pick out is um, acquisition price sensitivity analysis. Now, why is that important? Now, I put in a six cap, right? I want five points because I think it's going to be somewhere between five and seven. I don't know what the value is yet. I haven't gotten there. It's around six. 
So when I print my report, I'm going to do a, a bookend of 7 and 5, and I'm going to do 5 bullets, and I'm going to give it a range, and it's going to give me 5 uh, points what the value is based on income and expenses. And it puts together, of course, giving you the uh, value, the, or the um, income over a 10-year period. But what I also want is an explanation of what that value is based on a 7 cap, a 6.5, a 6, a 5.5, and a 5. And the range of value is 850 to 1.2 million. And I'm going to be able to use this with a client and go through and try and explain why I think you're a little bit higher or a little bit lower. It's a great tool. It's an absolutely wonderful tool when you're going in for the first time and you're trying to figure out where you are. Again, highlighting this a little bit better, I had the uh, sensitivity analysis go from 5 to 7% cap rate, same income, same expenses, and it gives you a range of values. It makes it easier to talk to the client. And I can point to something on the chart when we're looking at it. All right, so we have to look at future cap rates. What's going to happen? Why does it matter what cap rates are in the future? Because it affects the income received by buyers, and the buyers will adjust their buying price today to what their future expectations are. And we all know cap rates are rising, right? How many of you think it's a really great time to buy investment property? How many of you think it's a really bad time to buy investment property? I always think it's better to buy something that's a solid asset than something that's not. But if you're buying at a low cap rate, and in five years you need to get rid of it, and you're at a high cap rate, it makes it a little bit more challenging to get rid of that asset. Cap rates and value are inversely related. As cap rate rises, the value decreases. And we've seen this in many examples over time. So the things that affect cap rate are the property type and quality. That's not going to change. We have CVS versus dollar store. The location, the credit worthiness of the tenant, and then the other things that we can't control are supply and demand and how much the borrowing rates are. We want to make money on the spread. We want to make money on the money that we're borrowing from a bank. And we have less income from equity if we have a problem with rates being too high. Some of the current risk we're looking at is we're seeing rising interest rates. And we're expecting higher exit cap rates than we have right now. We do have some weaker investor demand in some markets, and we're expecting lower rent growth. Now, we had just went through a period of huge growth in multifamily and in warehouse industrial. But we're looking at slower rent growth going forward, at least that's the prediction. Now, two years ago, this says 0.647, but two years ago, the 10-year uh, treasury was at 0.51. Last night, it was at 3.96. We're predicting where the market is going, where the interest rates are going, based on looking at the 10-year treasury. Unfortunately, I don't think that's going to stop going up at this point. It's always a guess what's going to happen. See it go up and down a little bit. But I think we're going to continue to rise a little bit. Over the last 50 years, the average interest rate was a little over 8. So it's not unusual to be up in this level, but when people were able to get SBA loans at 2.25% two and a half years ago, it makes it more challenging to sell that building and buy something to replace it with because they're paying a much higher interest rate. So the higher the cost of borrowing money, the lower our return on equity. And this is uh, the Green Street Commercial Property Price Index. It's really kind of fascinating. They have the base year at 2007. So in 2007, it says 99 here, but we're at 100%. Whatever the average mix of commercial property being sold at that point in time was the baseline at 100%. So we rose from 1998 at about 50. We doubled in price from 1998 to 2007 in commercial real estate. Then we had the crash. And the crash dropped to 63.5. What that means is, if you paid a million dollars for a property in 2007, it was probably worth, on average, 635,000 two years later. Unfortunately, we all remember those days painfully. It's been rising steadily ever since, and we peaked 156.5. So we were up 55% in commercial property value from the peak in 2007. But over the last four months, we've dropped down to 133. Still better than 2007, but that's not a real great uh, chart right here. Our value is coming down at the moment. We don't know if it'll continue to come down or not, depending on what happens next. In a slowing market, the assets that are most likely affected tend to be the uh, Class B and Class C, whether we're looking at retail or office, because quality spaces are more easily rented by creditworthy tenants, creating more risk for moderate and low-tier properties. That means that the cap rate spread gets wider 
between class A and class B. So we're going to buy at a much lower rate, cap rate, for class A than we will for B and C. Exit cap rates. Why sell now if you're a, an investor? Now this is something that gets kind of tricky because obviously we want sales and it's a really good time to sell certain asset classes. Multifamily, warehousing, it's a pretty good time to sell. But then what do you put the money into? It's also a good time to buy hard assets. But in this case, if we're selling a warehouse right now at a five cap and we've got an income of 100,000, at a five cap, that's a $2 million investment, $2 million purchase. If cap rates go up to 8%, that drops that value by 750,000 lost value, unless the growth rate on that income is significant at the same income level. And that's one of the things that institutional investors are looking at. So let me give you an example from 2007. All right, so some of these REITs were buying skyscrapers. Let's say you bought a skyscraper with a $90 million NOI. If you're in Manhattan, 90 million, the cap rate at that time was about four and a half. So a $90 million NOI is worth $2 billion. And there are realtors, or actually former students of mine, who've sold properties like this. $2 billion sale. Real Estate Investment Trust borrows 70% loan to value at the time. Pretty common in practice. So they're borrowing $1.4 million. Two years later, they're making exactly the same income. Maybe a little bit more because of the growth rate. But two years later, the market crashes, and institutional investors are saying, we're not buying unless we get at least an eight cap. So if we get at least an eight cap, 90 million divided by eight cap is 1.125 billion, over $800 billion paper loss. Now that wouldn't worry me so much, but the reason the REIT stocks crashed is because everybody's on a five-year term on their commercial loans. And all these investors on Wall Street panicked because they thought all these buildings were gonna go back to the banks. Because if the value goes from 2 billion to 1.125, when you go to refinance it, now you can only borrow 65% loan to value. 65% of 1.125 is a whole lot less than they owe on the property, they don't have the cash. And where are they gonna get the cash from? So they won't be able to do anything, they're all gonna go under, that was the thought process. And some of these stocks went from 100 to five, six, seven dollars overnight. Now within a year or two, what really happened was the banks don't want these properties back, so the banks just extended the loans, and the stock price went back up. But at the time, there was all out panic, because on paper, those cap rates were much higher, the values were much lower, so your assets were devalued. Now the same thing happens on any small property that you have if those cap rates swing that widely. If we get to a point where, every, where buying investment property is out of style and you're gonna be buying downtown properties at a 10 cap instead of a five, on paper your property's worth half as much. So if you need to get out, that might become a problem unless your growth rate continues to climb. That brings us to discounted cash flow. Because direct cap only works in stabilized properties, there are other ways we've got to figure out how to value certain assets. And without getting into the weeds too much, and I'm sure all of you have seen this before, discounting is the same idea as compounding, but in reverse. So if you put $1,000 in the bank and it grows at 3% a year, you're, this year you have $1,030, and next year you get 3% more of that 1,030. So it grows exponentially over time. Discounting is taking that money in the future and discounting it back to today's dollars. And we use software to do this. In this case, we're gonna use Excel. We're trying to figure out what something's worth at the end, not necessarily now. So let's say we happen to have a building that we're holding onto for five years, and it's growing over that five-year period. We've got 89.1 in NOI today. We've got 91.773 in year two. By year five, we've got 100,000 in income, and we're gonna have a net selling price of 1.33 million. So my total cash flow over this five-year holding period is my net income plus my uh, reversion at the end, my sale price, my net sale price. I'm gonna take that information and turn that into what it's worth in today's dollars based on what my expectations are of growth. So my expectations, if they're 10%, if I expect a 10% uh, growth rate or a 10% return, I'm gonna discount those back at 10%. We also use cost of capital and some other things, but I don't wanna go into the weeds here. 
So that value of that income stream, including the sale, in today's dollars, if I'm discounting back by 10% compounded in reverse, is 1.06 million. Now we do this if we have a non-stabilized asset because things may change over time. Now if you have a stabilized asset, this number should come really close to what your cap rate is if you apply a cap rate today because cap rates are based on future income. So if I did both and I had a stabilized asset and if I had the right discount rate that's typical for the marketplace from that chart on IRR.com, you're gonna get about the same number. But if you don't have a stabilized property, if you've got something unusual, then we're gonna use it to try and value it in today's dollars. And I'll show you an example in a minute. Financial calculators will do this. All you have to do is put in cash flow in year uh, zero is zero, that's today. Each year what your cash flow is, and then year five you're gonna add in whatever your net sales price is, and you're gonna compute net present value, the net present value of whatever your cash flows are. And you're gonna come up with a number. Now again, why would I use a discounted cash flow? I might have a development parcel. And how do, you, how do you price a development parcel? Now keep in mind, you're gonna lose money for the next two or three years while you're getting through zoning, right? So how do you direct cap a negative number? You may have properties that are not fully leased. You may have properties that are underperforming, properties that are overperforming, which I'll show you, or single tenant properties that are at the end of their lease. So let's say, for example, We've got an office building that's partially occupied with triple net tenants. It's got an income of 100,000 a year. Uh, during the lease up period, it might go to 150,000 NOI next year and 200,000 NOI in year three. The buyer's gonna look at that 100,000 NOI and they're gonna say, listen, the cap rate today is 5%, I've got 100,000 NOI, even though the building's half empty, it's worth $2 million. But the seller's gonna say, listen, you can rent the building tomorrow. And once you have it rented, you have $200,000 NOI, so it's really worth $4 million. Neither one of them is correct, by the way, but they have very difference of opinion. We talked about paradigm on, on Friday. The owner wants to tell you it's worth $4 million, and they want to try and market it at that, but it's not rented. And the buyer wants to pay $2 million because of the NOI. So what we're going to do is, if we're going to have 50,000 more NOI next year and, and 100,000 more in 2025, I'm gonna do two things. I'm gonna put this on a table. I'm gonna put 100,000 NOI in 2023, 150 in 2024, 200 in 2025, and I'm gonna sell it. So in 2025, I'm gonna figure out what the value is based on that $200,000 NOI. I'm gonna divide that by a 5% cap rate so that my total cash flow is 100 in year one, 150 in year two, and 4.2, including the net sales price in year three. Does so everybody understand where those numbers came from? And then I'm gonna go into Excel and I'm gonna put equals NPV and in parentheses I'm gonna put whatever my discount rate is. I'm gonna to go to that chart in IRR. I'm gonna find a discount rate for a typical investment property like this is 8%. I'm gonna plug in 8% comma and I'm gonna put in those other three numbers. And it's gonna kick back that at an 8% discount rate, this income stream over the next three years is worth 3.55 million in today's dollars. So to an investor, that's, that's looking for this 8% discount rate, that 5% cap rate, that's what it's worth to them in today's dollars. That's what an institutional investor will pay. If we have a 10% discount rate, let's say we're a little worried about the uh, chance that it's actually gonna rent the way the landlord thinks it is. So we might put on a higher discount rate, it still gives us a value of $3.4 million, significantly higher than the two million they're paying today. Now the problem with this scenario is the bank doesn't want to hear it. So many lenders, there are some that'll base it on a pro forma, but many lenders won't accept a pro forma expectation of growth and they'll only loan money based on the current income. And that sometimes becomes a problem. So we do this. We do an acquisition loan from a uh, bank based on the value that it is on a direct cap. And we might do mezzanine financing for some of the difference at a higher interest rate on a temporary basis. And then when we have the property stabilized, when we've got that 93% occupancy or 95% occupancy or whatever it is, we refinance it into a permanent mortgage. Does that make sense? Because this may be the only way to make that work and still pay the, the right price for it. That's called a discounted cash flow. Difference between lending and valuing, lenders are risk averse and higher risk means a higher interest rate charged. 
And remember, lenders aren't looking at the exact same thing as we are. They want a loan to value ratio, they want a combined loan to value ratio, they want a debt coverage ratio, and that's what often skews this when we're doing a pro forma. They need a certain amount of money, a certain num a number of dollars per dollar of income earned, or, or per a dollar of mortgage. Might need a dollar fifty of income against a dollar of, uh, of debt. And lately we've been running into debt yield ratio, which is a new form they're using. So if a property is stable, the cap rate value should come very, very close to discounted cash flow because the short-term cap rate is based on stabilized return over time. How about a falling asset? We've got a corner property. This is a real example, by the way. Corner property, it's land leased on a triple net basis to CVS for 200,000 a year. The lease ends in two years and CVS is not gonna renew. Why? Because this is a 30-year-old store and the lot's not big enough. And CVS's today are bigger than they were 30 years ago. So CVS is not going to renew the lease. Got 200,000 a year coming in. Chances are we're gonna rent it to a dollar store or a McDonald's. So we're gonna get 120, 130,000 net instead of 200,000. Because of that, their income is gonna be lower. So the owner wants to dump it now while they have 200,000 in income. So the owner's looking at this saying, I've got 200,000, triple net, 5% cap rate for a CVS, it's worth $4 million all day long. But any smart investor is gonna look at it and say your lease has 19 months left and you're not renting this again for 200,000. So the investor wants to look at what it's worth once that tenant moves out and take that 120,000 and divide it by 5% and you come up with 2.4 million. Huge spread again. So we're gonna try and do the same thing with this. And even if you account for a higher risk and raise the cap rate to 6% instead of five, you're still way undervalued. We're gonna look at a 10 year hold and the first two years are at 200,000 NOI. The next uh, eight years, we're at 120,000 or maybe we increase it by 3% a year. But whatever we do, we plug in that income at the end of year 10, I'm gonna divide it by whatever we perceive to be the cap rate going out, the exit cap rate, create a net sales price, and again, I'm gonna put in equals NPV, 8% comma, and that whole string. And it's gonna tell me today's dollars is worth 2.167 million. That gives me the realistic value based on how an institutional investor will do it. I'm gonna do a sensitivity analysis. Let's say I think the discount rate is gonna be somewhere between seven and 10%, so I've got a value between 1.9 and 2.3. One of the other things we're seeing very heavily right now in CBD, in central business districts, is some of these long-term leases. A lot of office space, and I'm hearing this in Boston, DC, Miami, a lot of these office spaces were rented for 10 or 20 years, and people have not come back to the office. And because of that, there's a lot of space sitting empty. What happens as some of these leases renew? A lot of that space is gonna probably be discounted to get more people in. Right now in Manhattan, some of these new buildings, they're giving away 14 months free rent, plus about 100% in tenant improvements. So you've got over two years of no income to get somebody into that space. That's pretty painful. How do you justify that? How do you actually value that? We're gonna do the same thing, we're gonna put it in. Valuing and development. If I have time at the end, I'll get into this, but uh, one of the things we look at is a discounted cash flow model. Now, there's a difference between the spread of the cost and the spread of the market uh, cap rates, but basically, we've got year one and year two, we might be losing money on development. Year three, four, and five, we start really making money. So we're gonna figure out what our discount rate is for this. We're gonna plug in until we're out of the project. Either we refinance it or we sell out the houses if we're building houses, and we come up to a value of it by discounting it backward. There's another way of doing it called a hurdle rate, which we might get into at the end. Hurdle rate allows us to calculate what our cost is, come up with what we call the residual value of the land, and then make sure we actually hit our returns that we need to hit. Approaches we use for value, again, on an apartment building, we're probably using direct capitalization, the cap rate formula. On an office building, we're gonna use direct capitalization unless it's not stabilized. On a large warehouse, we're gonna use the sales comparison approach and the direct capitalization approach, and we'll also look at cost. And a parcel of land, we're gonna probably use a sales comparison approach, although we may be using direct cap based on the income we might be able to generate. The other one I'll throw in here is hotels. They're great uh, money makers, they can be. One thing you have to keep in mind, now you'll see a lot of different uh, ways these are structured. Some call the net income gross operating profit. 
Some call it net operating income. But typically, we base the value off the net operating income. In hotels, we actually include the reserves also because you're constantly replacing the furniture and everything in it. So we have to have a reserve for FF&E included in it to get a net cash flow. So we're actually gonna price it based on the net cash flow after the FF&E, not before like we would in a different asset. Now, if I'm trying to value something, we look for software it's gonna work. For hotels, I suggest something called HVS, Hotel Valuation Software. It's wonderful for putting stuff together. Um, we have a spreadsheet for uh, self-storage. You know, any type of asset, there's somebody's got a spreadsheet that you can use to try and value it, try and figure out what you can do. And this breaks down into types of units, uh, income from each unit, and how to actually lay it out. So there's lots of software you can use for different types of assets, different types of properties. Now what I'm gonna do today is try and figure out eight properties. I'm gonna do two with you, and then I'm gonna have everybody work on the other six, and I'm gonna go through how we actually arrive at the values. We're gonna call it the gold portfolio, and in this case, as a member of the Central Trail and Commercial Investment Team, you've been tasked with reviewing the assets of the gold portfolio to determine how to best deploy the portfolio's funds. You're gonna place a current market value on the equity in each existing property. You're gonna determine if you would recommend holding onto each property or selling that. And you're gonna be, well, I'm not gonna get into the strategy of deploying funds because of time. This is the cap rate table that's on your table that we're using. Now again, this has no bearing in reality. This is just an example of uh, a typical cap rate table. So an office, for example, central business district cap rates between nine and 10. A better asset, better stabilized asset, better tenants is gonna be at a nine. Worse is gonna be at a 10. Suburban eight and a half to nine and a half, shopping malls, power centers, grocery anchored community centers, and specialty centers are all different ranges. Hotels, industrial, research and development, apartments and multifamily, and specialized commercial like restaurants and parking lot garages. So I use this table regularly when we're trying to show different kinds of assets. Now the two that I'm gonna do, I picked out, I think it's number six and seven, St. Paul parking lots. But anyway, St. Paul parking lot. We've got two parcels in St. Paul that are currently being used as parking lots. One is half an acre, one's a little over an acre, and they have a total income of 150,000 net because it's triple net lease. They bought it in 2018 for $1.5 million. So just because somebody paid 10 million for a property doesn't mean it's worth 10 million today. Does that make sense? So we've got two parcels. Now normally we just do a cap rate and divide 150,000 by whatever you expect the parking lot to be and come up with the value. But then we've got more information. The first parcel that half acres is leased at a 20 year triple net lease for 50,000 a year escalating at the inflation rate of 3%. So we got a 20 year stabilized asset. Parcel two, a little over an acre, is leased for 100,000 a year on a triple net lease, but it expires in six months, they're not gonna renew, and there's no prospects on the horizon. There have been two lots sold downtown recently, one for 30 bucks a square foot and one for 32, for people using it for their own offices. Both properties are zoned for office and located in downtown St. Paul in the office district. They're zoned for buildings as high as 20 stories. Don't worry, I'll go through this and explain it. Maximum coverage of 80% of the ground and requires underground parking of three spaces per thousand square feet of building. It's uh, the downtown office vacancy rate is 18.5%. Rents are 24 to 26 bucks a square foot with eight bucks in operating expenses, meaning a net income of 16 to 18 bucks. I'm not trying to make your head hurt. I'm gonna come around to it. Uh, modern office tower construction right now is about 240 bucks per square foot and that includes the underground parking and developers are looking for a hurdle rate of at least 12%. Now when you see this, this scares the daylights out of most commercial realtors. This actually isn't that hard. But it scares everybody because there's so much stuff here. And how many times have we heard, well this lot is really valuable because you can put this on it, right? You can put a 20 story building here. I mean, you can pay anything for this lot and make money because you can put 20 stories on it. The reality is we want to figure out what our highest and best use is and how we can value this without driving ourselves insane. And it's actually not that bad. Now, parcel one is easy. It's rented for 20 years. If it's rented for 20 years and you've got a stabilized income, what method of evaluation do we use? Direct capitalization. We simply divide that 50,000 by whatever the cap rate is and come up with a value for parcel one. So we've got a long-term lease. So 
We look at the cap rate chart and we find out that it's between 9 and 11%. And I figure this is a pretty good risk because it's been there for a long time and they've got a 20 year lease outstanding. So we're gonna use the lower end, maybe 9%. So if we've got an income of 50,000, I might sell it based on next year's net income. That's a common practice. I'm gonna multiply 50,000 by 1.03 to get the actual income for next year. I'm gonna divide that by 9% and I'm gonna come up with a value of 572,222. All right, so that part's easy. Second part gets a little bit more challenging. We've got this 50,000 square foot lot with the lease expiring in six months and they're not going to renew it. So do we use a direct cap? Probably not because we don't have a tenant. Do we use a sales comparison approach? Our sales comparison approach, we've got two sold lots recently, one for 30 bucks a square foot and one for 32. If I use the 32, that means the value of the property is 1.6 million, 32 bucks times 50,000 square feet. If I was able to find another tenant, I might get 100,000, if I inflate it by 3%, 103,000, but I'm gonna be at the upper end of the cap rate range because it's risky as to whether or not we're gonna get somebody to take that parking lot. So maybe we get 936,000 if we get it rented as a parking lot. But we're probably gonna go with the sales comparison approach. Now what about all that office building stuff? Combined value, if I use that sales comparison approach on lot two, uh, direct cap on lot one, we've got a total value of about 2.17 million. Now about the office stuff. We can build 20 stories on it. Now this gets into the weeds, which is why I almost always suggest you start looking at any valuation on a per square foot basis, rather than trying to calculate it out. And I'm gonna do that first, then I'm gonna actually use the whole thing. All this stuff boils down to a couple of keys. Office rents are 24 to 26 bucks a square foot gross, 16 to 18 net. We've got a big vacancy rate of 18 and a half percent. It costs $240 a square foot to build. The cap rates in downtown office are nine to 10%, and we're looking at a 12% hurdle. So that's the most important stuff we're looking at right now. Everything else setting it aside. If I try and figure out the income formula on this, worst case, we only get 24 bucks a square foot instead of 26. We've got a vacancy rate of 18 and half percent and expenses of eight bucks. Our NOI, our net income is $11.56 per square foot. I wanna explain why I'm doing this by square foot. If my cap rate on office is 10% from the chart, the value when I'm done per square foot is 11.56 divided by 10 is 116 bucks a square foot. It's gonna cost me 240 to build it. Rather than going through 20 stories at 80% 80 80 coverage, that's worst case, 24 bucks, Eight bucks in expenses, 18.5% uh, vacancy is only 11.56 per square foot net income divided by 10 cap. And we have a lower value when we have it built than it cost us to build it. If I even do a best case and I'm renting it at 26 bucks a square foot, I still have a net income of only 13. And if I have a cap rate at the lower end of the spectrum at 9%, 13 divided by 9% is still only $147. My cost is 240. By the time I'm done, I'm, I'm down 100 bucks a square foot in value. Now I could go through and try and multiply it out. I've got a lot size of 50,000 square feet. I can cover 80% of it. That means 40,000 square feet per floor plate, per floor. I can multiply that by 20 and say I can put an 800,000 square foot building on this. It's gonna cost me 240 bucks a square foot to build, so I've got $192,000 in cost to build. If I then rent it at the high end at 26 bucks a square foot and I multiply that by 80,000 square feet, I've got $20.8 million in gross income. I've got expenses of $8 a square foot and a vacancy rate of 18.5%. So my NOI is 10.5 million. I can take that NOI, I can divide it by my cost, 10 divided by 192, and I've got a, a return of 5.5%. I am still getting a return even though I've lost money building it. The value is lower than what I paid to build it. I'm still getting a return, but it's below the developer's threshold. The developer needs a higher return, so it doesn't work. So that's a couple of ways of looking at that. Second example I'll give you real quick is Providence Community Center in Charming, California. 
220,000 square foot community shopping center. They paid 22.5 million in 2019. And we've got a gross income. We've got a net operating income of 2.028 million. Now we're gonna base value if we're doing a direct cap on this NOI. I don't care about capital improvements. I don't care about leasing commissions. Why? Because we're not gonna have that same number every year. Those capital improvements might change from year to year. I wanna look at it on the NOI basis and try and value it if I was doing a direct cap based on that. So if I'm looking at this just straight on, value is 2.028 divided by whatever the cap rate is, but I've got more information. And the more information is the occupancy rate in this uh, building is 97%, it's consistent with the market, that's great, it's stable. Tenants are 100% responsible for the common area maintenance, operating expenses and taxes. CAM is three bucks a square foot. All leases were 10 year leases and they were given to them at a 10, uh, 10 year discounted rate because this developer desperately wanted to get somebody in there. So they rented the anchor stores at six bucks and they rented the inland stores at 14 bucks. When the actual market rents are 10 bucks for anchor and 20 bucks for inline. So we're way below market. And every one of the leases expires in two years and is expected that the tenants are gonna renew at market rates. At that point, whoever the agent is, is gonna be paid 5% of the first year's rent as their uh, leasing commission for everybody in the building. There also happens to be a three acre pad site in front of the shopping center that they never did anything with, and it's worth about 100,000 an acre. So how am I gonna value this? The only way to do this accurately is to do a discounted cash flow because we're way under value and it's gonna change shortly. All market leases are gonna expire in two years and it's expected that all tenants will renew at market rates. So what I'm gonna do if I'm doing a direct cap, again, if I take that NOI of 2.028 million and divide it by somewhere between eight and 9% because that's what's in the chart, I'm gonna get a value between 22.5 and 25 million at today's income. But direct cap is probably not the best method. So I'm gonna figure, right now, I've got an income of 2.112 gross. If I raise those rates from, 10 and, or from 6 and 14 to 10 and 20, that drives the income from 2.1 to 3.2 million. So now I'm gonna plug that in and I'm gonna do the same thing with the discounted cash flow. I'm gonna do each year's operating statement. I've got, on the operating income, 2.028 for the first year, 2.028 for the second year because it's at the same rate, but I'm jumping to over three million in year three. I'm also gonna take that net income from year three and I'm gonna divide it by whatever the expected cap rate is to come up with a sales price. Because the only way I'm gonna get the value of this is actually to have the total net. So I'm gonna take that 3.074 million, I'm gonna divide it by the cap rate to come up with a residual value, a sales, net sales price of 34.3 million. I'm gonna take these numbers plug them into the net present value calculation and come up with a value of 31.2 million. So if I am looking at a direct cap, the direct cap only has a value today of 22.5 to 25.3, but this is a pretty large value add. The likely sales price in only 36 months from now is over 34 million. But to an institutional investor today, it's worth 31.3 because of the return they're making. There are six other properties in there that you can kind of go through. Some of them are direct cap. I think one of them sales comparison. And there might be one that's discounted cash flow. Try and look through them and see if you can figure out what they would be worth. I'm gonna go through how I came up with the values, okay? But again, everything we're using is based on this cap rate chart for this particular example. And something that is really solid, stabilized, and, and uh, uh, a good asset might be on the lower end of the cap rate range. On the higher end, it's gonna be something that uh, might be a little bit riskier for a buyer or for a lender. So the first one is Country Place in South Park. That's where Cartman's from, no. So we've got a 20,000 square foot Class A office space built in 2015, they paid $2.8 million. You've got a uh, income statement here. And again, whenever you're valuing something, look at that net operating income because that's the important number. There might be tenant improvements, there might be leasing commissions, there might be renovations. We want to just put a parking lot in, but all those things come under the line, below the line. We want that NOI, that consistent income for the value. 
Now in this case, only one new tenant for 2,000 square feet was put in in 2022. They renewed a couple of tenants. Current vacancy rate in the submarket is 5%, but they do point out all the rental rate is $24 per square foot gross, and the landlord is paying eight bucks per square foot in operating expenses. There is in that marketplace 600,000 square feet under construction with three buildings going up right now. That's gonna become competition. 25% of the tenant's leases come due in the next two years, and the property is gonna need a roof five years out for about 175,000. Now again, you'll see a lot of this, ty this type of information when you're trying to value something. It doesn't mean that all of it means anything. It just gives you a better idea of risk. Everything we're looking at is risk. How risky is this particular property compared to others? If we use a direct cap method, the range is between eight and a half and nine and a half for this type of property. I would probably use the upper end because the competition coming into the market means there's more risk for an investor. There's also some repairs that have to be done. If a roof is going bad, probably there's some other stuff. So I'd still use it as a, high, a riskier possible property compared to the average. So I'm gonna use an upper end number. So the net income is 300,800. If I take the highest cap rate of 9.5, I've got a value of 3.167 million. It's a fairly straightforward one. We can also decide that we are inflating it by 3% because all these are going up by 3%. If I'm valuing a property, I almost always try and use the net income from next year, not this year. So if I'm using net, next year's net income, I'll multiply the uh, NOI by 1.03. So my NOI is actually closer to 309 divided by 9.5%, so I'm at 3.261 million, just to give you a, a flavor of what we might do. Property number two in Twin Peaks, Washington. 45,000 square foot, three building office park, built in 1988, a little bit trickier. We've got a building leased at $18 per square, per square foot with a base stop of $4 per square foot, and actual expenses are five and a quarter. What does that mean? So this is something that I get asked a lot. A base stop is what the landlord is willing to contribute toward the expenses. So if we have 45,000 square feet, the landlord's expenses are capped on a base stop of $4 times 45,000 square feet. That's the maximum the landlord's gonna pay in, net in, in uh, operating expenses. So operating expenses are not gonna rise on the landlord expense. Base stop means we're capping the landlord expense. So we've got $18 a square foot uh, lease rate. We've got a base stop of four bucks a square foot that caps what they're expanding. The actual expenses are five and a quarter. That doesn't matter. All we wanna know is what the landlord's paying. Occupancy is at 92% and it's been the same for two years. So chances are we're already capped out, but the market has a vacancy rate of only 5%. So we're a little lower than the market. Not significantly, but a little lower than the market. So our net operating income is 565. Now we also happen to have a million dollar loan on this, which makes our cash flow a little bit lower. But our NOI is what we're pricing buildings on. We always price on the NOI. So 565 too. If I use a direct cap between eight and a half and nine and a half, occupancy is close to the market, but not quite. So I might take a number in the middle. Maybe I'll take 9%, but I can give them the range, eight and a half to nine and a half. At 9% in the middle, we're at 6.28 million as a value. Now, the other thing I might do, I might decide that there's, he's not been trying to rent this building for some reason. We could get that up to a 95% stabilized occupancy. So rather than try and do a discounted cash flow, we just inflate it by 3% and say that we should be at the market rate of a 5% vacancy. So if we were at 95%, if we added a little bit more income in, our net income is 589.5. Again, divided by 9% uh, gives us 6.55 million. So we're somewhere in this range. Now this is not an exact science, but it gives us a range. We're probably gonna sell somewhere between six and a quarter and six and a half million. Pretty straightforward. Property number three, Stars Hollow, Connecticut. Anybody know that show? Gilmore Girls, is that what it is? All right, 120 garden style apartments, built in 1988, sold last for 9.5 million in 2017. We've got an income statement where the net income is 1.022 million. It appears to be no capital improvements or leasing commissions. So that's what we've got. Vacancy rate in the market is three and a half percent. Complex is 5%. Minimal new supply coming into the market. So it should be doing better and better. 
got recent comparable sales between 100,000 and 110,000 a unit. And we could increase rents by 10% over the next two years with incremental capital improvements of 400,000. If we add a fitness room, tennis courts, and a pool, we're gonna probably get another 200,000, I'm sorry, a 5% increase next year and another 5% increase the year after that. So this has a couple of moving parts. Now this is where we might look at a discounted cash flow for the higher income to try and figure out what that number is on the higher income. And we have a breakdown of what the units are. We've got a good mix, one bedrooms, two bedrooms, and three bedrooms. We've got the price per square foot that we're actually getting. In this case, and again, I did not inflate this by 3% like I sh probably should have, but recent sales comps are um, 100 to 110,000. That's between 12 and 13 million as an income, or as a sales price. Now, that is really just a justification factor. I'm not gonna price it based on a price per unit. That's just to be able to check what my work is. I've got a huge cap rate range, seven and a half to nine and a half percent. So at seven and a half percent, and again, I did not apply the 3% increase in, in the market. At seven and a half percent, the value is 13.6. At nine and a half, the high cap rate is 10.8. Which would you think is more appropriate for this particular building? lower cap rate because you don't have any new inventory coming into the marketplace and the population just keeps growing. Now in this case, if I were trying to do a, a discounted cash flow and I put 400,000 into it, I put 200,000 in this year and 200,000 in next year and I inflate the income 5% for next year, now not adding the other 3%, 5% higher next year and 10% of this year for the year after total. Um, and then I run an NPV on it. Now I've got a value on a direct cap of 12.5 to 15.8 million in two years. So the value in two years, if I hold on to it for another two years, I put that work into it and I add that 400,000, I'm gonna add significantly more than that in value. So this is when we're advising a client. On the low end, it's worth 10.8 today, but if I put 400,000 in investment into it, it's worth 12 and a half, almost 2 million difference. If I put 400,000 into it and it's on the high end, I'm at $2.2 .2 million difference. So it makes sense, not from your standpoint because you want to sell it and get the commission, but for the owner's perspective to put that extra investment into it, charge the higher rates, and end up turning around and selling it for more money in 24 months. All right, property four was the shops at Lakeside and the Ozarks. We've got a specialty and power center. Now this gets a little trickier. So the specialty center is older, built in 81. Power center is built in 2003. Power centers these days are where you have a shopping center where it's almost all big box stores. There's no, not a whole lot of inline stores. You don't get a lot of those small pizza shops and dry cleaners and stuff like that. So that's what a power center is. Now we've got this building and the breakdown shows the NOI of almost $8 million. And up at the top on the right, we've got the promenade, which I believe is the um, specialty center, I have to look in a second, is 80,000 square feet and fairway is the other. And we have it broken down into how much are anchor stores and how much are inline retail. Properties leased to credit tenants, meaning we've got good tenants in there. Occupancy rate's been hovering around 8% vacancy for the last four years. The majority of anchor tenants have more than five years left in their lease, so the uh, rates are not gonna jump. They just did a lot of work last year in 2022 to resurface the parking areas, recoat the roofs, and upgrade some facades. So the place is in good shape. Uh, the shopping center has two components. The specialty center that's fashion oriented along the lake and a power center with minimal inline stores. So we've got actually two types of shopping centers in here. We've got a little office component as well. And we're trying to figure out what the value is. We can try and blend it what I typically do though is break it down. Now the first way, I'm not gonna keep it this way. First way is to break it down by square footage. Now I break it down by income, not square footage. But 40% of this project is specialty retail and 59% is power center and 1% is office. I don't care as much about the square footage other than what, how that leads to expense. What I'm really looking at is how much of the income and expenses are attributed to the specialty retail and how much to the, to the power center. And so I can calculate out if I've got 
80,000 square feet of anchor in the specialty retail and 82,000 square foot of inline. And anchors at 20 bucks and inlines at 35. I can figure out what the income is and then calculate what percentage goes to each. So 46.3% is specialty, 53.7% is power center. I'm gonna apply these back to the net income so I can use cap rates to value this asset. Putting this back together and actually separating out this income statement, I now have 46% under specialty retail and the rest in power center. I still have a vacancy rate of 8% across the whole thing and operating expenses I'm separating the same way. So now I come down to two different NOIs, one for the specialty retail, one for the power center. Now I didn't break out the office because I didn't want to get that far into the weeds and it's such a tiny component. But because the cap rate range is lower for power center than it is for specialty retail, I can apply the cap rates to the individual uses. So under specialty retail, it's somewhere between nine and 11%. So my low value is 33.6 million, my high value is 41. On the power center, I've got a cap rate range of eight to nine. So my value is between 47.7 and 53 million. So if I add these two together, I'm blending the use, I'm gonna have a value at the end. And by the way, this is the way you do mixed use anyway. If you're doing a mixed use where you've got a component that's commercial, uh, retail, a component that's office, and a component that's multifamily, you're gonna apply different cap rates to the different components of it. You have to blend it one way or another. Now you can look at it a couple of different ways. On the power center, we just did a lot of work on it. It's fairly new and it's all got credit tenants. Chances are I'm gonna value it at the higher end of the value, lower end of the cap rate range for that. I'm mixed on the specialty retail because we just did a whole lot of work redoing the facade, but it's an older center. So I'm gonna probably be somewhere in between here. And I'm gonna add these numbers together and I'm gonna come up with a value for this particular shopping center that's got the two components. All right, number five in Rosewood, Pennsylvania, that's from Pretty Little Liars, I think. Uh, interestingly enough, in that show, they, they apparently take a train about 45 minutes north into Bucks County, which is kind of where I am, and I've never seen Rosewood, PA. But 320,000 square foot industrial flex space. Now the challenge with this one is it's half empty again. So in 2021, the largest tenant occupying 144,000 square feet split. And although the rents have risen quickly over the last few years, there's a big empty space in it. And we're expecting not to be able to rent it for the next two years. Now we're guessing this, of course. It's gonna take us two years to get this rented. All the spaces are triple net with tenants paying $2 per square foot in CAM to cover their occupied percentage of the overall space. Why does the triple net matter? Because our operating expenses right now are based on the entire building, but what we're getting back as reimbursables is only based on the occupancy rate currently. So as we get more people in here, we're not only gonna have a higher gross income, but we're also gonna get more reimbursements. So in this case, if we looked at it today, and we took just the income, the net income that we have today, and we put it somewhere between eight and nine and a half percent cap rate, based on our chart, we're gonna be somewhere between 12 and 14 million in value. But the seller, of course, wants to price at 95% occupancy because that's typical in the market, but it's gonna take us two years to get there. So if we had 95% occupancy today, we'd have a value of almost $27 million, huge difference from 12 to 14. So again, we're gonna plug this in to a discounted cash flow, which you have in the Excel that we sent out. And we're gonna take the next two years of the same income we have now, I'm not inflating it by that 3%, and in year two, or at the end of year two, we're gonna actually have that extra tenant in there that's gonna bring it up to 95% occupancy. And we're also gonna get our reimbursements from 352 now up to 608,000 because we're getting that additional $2 per square foot for the other space that's now occupied. We're plugging in leasing commissions. If you wanna know the actual cash flow after capital, we're paying that 5%. So I'm gonna plug in leasing commissions so I don't know what my actual cash flow after capital is. But I'm gonna apply that NOI of 2.4 million in two years. I'm gonna divide that by the uh, cap rate to get a residual value of 26.11 million. 
So the next two years, I'm still making this low number of 1.1 million, but at the end of the third one, or three years out, we've got the income at the higher number plus the residual. I'm gonna put in equals NPV, 10% in this case I'm using, and the cash flows, and it comes up with a value of 23.3 million, which is lower than what the owner wants now, but much higher than what it would be worth if it was just a direct cap. Now, if you do take CCIM courses, which I highly recommend, one of the first things they're gonna give you is a CCIM calculator. That's an Excel spreadsheet that's pretty nice. It gives you all sorts of interesting stuff. There are lots of models you can pick up from different courses. Uh, the, what I gave you is a very simplistic model, but I want you to understand how to value using that. Then the final property we're doing is the Wayne Hilton in Gotham, New York, a 300 room creepy hotel. Um, they bought it for $21.4 million. And in this case, the reason I'm using a hotel is, again, we have to keep in the reserves for furniture, fixtures, and equipment. I get this question all the time. Normally, we're looking at the NOI, which also in many cases people list as the gross operating profit. You'll see those interchangeably. They're not really interchangeable, but you'll see them interchangeably on, on um, different outlines of income, different income statements. But my NOI, in this case, is 3.75 million but I have to factor in some of the cost of running that business, and that includes reserves for furniture, fixtures, and equipment. So my net cash from operations is what I apply a cap rate to. So in this case, that cap rate is a range of 10 to 12%, and it depends whether or not you think this is a highly stabilized asset or not. And we've got a value range between 20 and 24.2 million but uh, it's been there for 100 years, so hopefully it'll continue to operate. By the way, on financial due diligence, I've said this earlier, but make sure you have all the expenses, because very often when we get pro formas, you don't really have all the expenses on a building. You're gonna value this, you need to know exactly what, you actually, what your actual cost is. So make sure you do your financial due diligence. So I'll get to one other thing, which is pricing land development. There are lots of ways to price land development. What we're trying to figure out is, what is our cost to actually do it? So the price at which the difference between the total project value and the total cost, including land, provides a return sufficient for a developer to do the development. Keep in mind that if you buy a stabilized asset, you don't have a whole lot of risk. You've got people in there, you've got businesses in there, you're renting it, you actually have a return. If you're buying a piece of land that you're going to possibly run into problems with, you might run into a tree frog that's been endangered or wetlands or somebody dumped oil on the property or something goes wrong with zoning or the building uh, uh, commission decides they want something extra put in the building or you have to change out all the glass that you put in after you've already started construction. All sorts of things you can run into. What we look at sometimes, uh, there's two ways to do it. One of them is to look at our project cost and try and figure out what our cost cap rate is what a builder is going to buy as a cost cap rate, and that might be 12%. And when the building is actually open, running, and stabilized, we're going to look at what the market is that we can turn around and sell it for. And this spread between them, the project cost and the current value, is the developer's profit. Now, what we try and figure out is how long it's going to take to create that profit. And we're borrowing money and we're taking risks the entire time. So if we're looking at a land development project, whether it's houses or whether you're building an office building or a shopping center, You've got to start with what it's worth at the end and back into what you can pay for the lot and still make your hurdle rate. So what we look at is that spread between the market cap and the, and the regular cap, and it's still an IRR calculation. Now the quick version is we're looking for three factors. One is how long is it going to take us to get this project complete and stabilized? If we're building a shopping center, how long are we going to have it 90% occupied or 95% occupied that we can refinance it and cash out? If we're doing a housing development, how long till we can sell them out and get out of the project? And we're going to also figure out how much of the project we're financing and what our rate's going to be and how much we're putting in equity and what kind of return we need for that. So for example, if I have a residential project that's going to take two years from today to build and sell all the units that I'm building, and I'm going to put down 35% in equity, or I'm going to get equity partners, I'm going to get five of you in this room to put down 35%, and we want to target 20% return. That 20% return, which is not unusual for developers, is actually on the 35% that you're putting in, not what you're borrowing. 
So I'm borrowing 65% at 6% interest rate. I need a 20% target return or I'm not gonna do the deal. So to figure out the hurdle rate, I'm gonna take the percentage I'm borrowing, 65%, at a 6% rate. I'm gonna to add to it the 35% we're putting in in equity at a 20% return. I'm gonna multiply all of this by two because I want 20% per year, not in two years. And that blended rate means if I get a 22% return, if I have a hurdle rate, a 22% return I'm able to get, that gives me my 20% return per year on the 35% equity I put in. Does that sort of make sense? I think I lost half a year. What I'm trying to do is I'm making money partly on what the bank gives us at a 6% rate. That helps me to have that number lower. I only need to make a 21.8% return, 22%, to give me my 20% per year on an investment of a development. And we put tables together like this. If it's gonna take me 18 months to get a development through, 24 months, 36 months, how much are we borrowing? How much are we putting in an equity? And we can come up with a blended rate as to what the hurdle rate might be. This is a cash on cash type return, and it's a quick version that developers use to try and figure out how they're gonna make this work. So the first thing I do is figure out how much is the project worth when I'm done? How much is the shopping center worth, the office building worth, the, the warehouse worth? or housing development worth, I'm gonna divide that by one plus whatever hurdle rate I'm gonna calculate. So again, 35% in from cash, I want 20% a year, so I need a 22% blended rate because I'm borrowing the rest. So project value divided by 1.22 gives me the supported investment that I can put into this project and make it work. And then if I wanna figure out how much I can pay for the land, I have to actually calculate roughly what it's gonna cost me to do everything to get to development, construction management, building costs, parking, and so on. And if I can figure out what my maximum supported investment is, take off the project costs without the land, that tells me what I can pay for the lot. But I've gotta figure out what that maximum supported investment is. Now I'm gonna show you an example real quick. We got a housing project we're gonna build. Got a piece of land we think houses are gonna work best on it. 25 townhomes, we're gonna sell them for 480,000 each. That's $12 million project value. The holding period, I'm gonna somehow build these within 12 months and blow them all out in 12 months. I'm gonna borrow 65% at a 6.5% interest rate. I'm gonna have equity of 35% I'm putting down. 20% rate of return is what I'm looking for. So my hurdle rate is 10.9%. I want a 20% return, but the reality is I'm making money on this 6% I'm borrowing. So 65% times 6%, their interest rate, plus 35% I'm putting down times 20%, means I need about 11% return on the whole project to make this work. So in order to figure this out, I know I'm gonna have 12 million in value at the end, I want a 20% return, my supported investment is the project value, 12 million, divided by one plus the hurdle rate we just calculated, 11%. 12 million divided by 1.109. That means I can pay up to 10.8 million for construction, land, and everything else, and still make my 20% return on the 35% equity. I've gotta figure out what that supported investment is. It's worth 12 million, I've gotta sell for 10.8 to make my return. So I might put out together a quick chart my building cost per square foot roughly, how much square feet each person, place is, what my site development cost is, we use uh, tables, what my cost for city uh, impact fees are, and then indirect costs, 5% of this, 5% of that, 10% of this. We plug all that in to come up with a ballpark. And what we find is that if we add all of the costs together based on tables, my total cost in for construction and indirect costs is 8.227 million. If my maximum investment is 10.8, 10.8 minus 8.27 leaves me two and a half million dollars to pay for the land and I can still make my 20% return on my 35% equity. This is an easier way that a lot of developers do to do a thumbnail sketch quick to see whether or not they can actually make a development cash flow. You can do the same thing with uh, retailer office space. So for example, if we've got a commercial developer building a 50,000 square foot office building, 
And again, we're borrowing 65% at 65% uh, 65% at 6 percentage straight, 35% equity, I want a 20% return. My hurdle rate again, it's gonna take me two years, 65% times 6% plus 35%, which is my equity, times 20% times two years, means I've gotta get 23% return on the whole project get, to give me a 20% per year return on my equity. My project value at the end, I've got a 50,000 square foot building I'm building, it's gonna have an NOI of 1.5 million. So my value at the end is at 1.5 million divided by a 6% cap rate or a value of $25 million. So if I wanna figure out how much I can put into this and still make my 20% return, I take the value at the end, 25 million, divide it by one plus the hurdle rate, 1.229, I can put in $20.3 million and I still have that spread covered that I'll make 20% on the 35% equity. And again, you figure it out the same way. 50,000 square feet, I'm renting it at 30 bucks a square foot, so I have an NOI of 1.5 million coming in a year. I divide that by a 6% cap rate, I've got a $25 million project value. I divide that by my hurdle rate, one plus my hurdle rate, 1.23. I can put in 20.3 million and still make my uh, returns. If I need to value the land, I run through a calculator, what's my construction cost for 50,000 square feet gonna be? What are my ballpark indirect costs? My total cost in is 13.2 million. If I subtract 13.2 million from the 20 million, that's my maximum support investment, I can pay whatever that number is, 7 million? 7.1 million dollars for the land and still hit my 20% return rate. This is a quickie way to value land development parcels when you're trying to hit a hurdle rate required by a developer. You have to know what the hurdle rate is. It's one way of doing it to try and come up with a ballpark as to what you're looking for to see if you can make this work. Thank you very much.